Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there and welcome back to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolan for episode 22 and today I'm honored to have on Kevin Weeks. Uh, Kevin Weeks and I first met back in 1991 in Kamloops, BC at one of the best Bantam tournaments in the country, the Kamloops International Bantam Ice Hockey Tournament, tournament, or better known by its acronym, KIBIT. And at the time, I was playing for a stacked Sherwood Park Flyers team. Uh, We had future NHLers on there like Damon Lankow and Nolan Pratt and Scott Lankow and myself. And and we were more than halfway through the season at that point, and we had not lost a game. But the Toronto Red Wings and Kevin Weeks were the talk of that tournament. And the Toronto Red Wings traveled a long way to get there, and we heard they were a powerhouse too, but they also had a lightning-quick black goaltender that drew much of the conversation. Uh, before the tournament even started, it seemed like we were destined to meet in the final, and both teams lived up to the hype. And although I did manage to get one past Kevin on a partial breakaway in the second period, it was not enough. And Toronto ended up beating us uh, four to three. Mr. Weeks and the Red Wings handed us our first loss of the season, and they took the tournament title. Uh, but given this current social climate and the Black Life Matters movement, this conversation that you will hear with Kevin provided me the opportunity to revisit that Kibbit tournament and my personal reaction at 14 year old at 14 years old to Kevin being being black and like many others from the rural rural west um, I had never comp- competed against a black player to that point a hockey rink was not a place where I was familiar with seeing people of color my own personal acknowledgement and curiosity were innocent and, and innocuous, but unfortunately for Kevin, that wasn't always the case. And Kevin drew attention. The color of Kevin's skin made him different, but so did his athleticism in the net. He was a damn good goalie. So people were always watching. Most were supporters, some were detractors, but Kevin knew from an early age that he was always auditioning. And this conversation here that you're about to listen to allowed me to contemplate the gravity of what it might have been like to be Kevin Weeks as a hockey player, because his experience was unquestionably much different than mine. And not only did he play the most isolating position in the sport, but he was often the only black player in the locker room. So everything else that I had to go through, or we as white athletes had to go through to get to that highest level, Kevin was undoubtedly under graded scrutiny and felt like he had to compete even harder and be squeakier clean uh, to get to where he wanted to get to. And years after Kivett, Kevin and I got drafted by the Florida Panthers, where we became teammates and friends, and I got to witness Kevin daily, and he earned my respect and admiration. Kevin has earned the respect throughout our great game from all levels of the sport, and he is respected for a lot of things, like his reverence and his knowledge of the game, for his journeyman 11-year NHL career with seven different teams, uh, part of which was his pivotal contribution to the Carolina Hurricanes run to the Stanley Cup final in 2002. He's respected for being a trailblazer and the first black analyst in the history of the sport, and also his ability as a broadcaster to connect the fans to the person behind their favorite player. Also for his dedication and commitment to constantly improve and master his craft. And most importantly, Kevin is respected because he respects everyone he meets. Kevin Weeks has a master's degree in what he calls Human 101. Given recent events surrounding our game and the events surrounding our country, Kevin has been a rational and experienced voice on the need for change within the game. He is campaigning for greater access, for greater inclusion, and for people of all colors and backgrounds to be welcomed and celebrated within the sport. Kevin says the NHL should be about putting the best people available in the room, and I agree. And whether you are able to make it to the greatest league in the world, hockey should be a safe place for everyone who plays it at all levels. So let's try to take a class in Human 101, as Weeksy would say it, and please enjoy my conversation with Kevin Weeks. Well, 
Well, look who we have here, Mr. Kevin Weeks. Welcome to Up My Hockey. It's been uh, it's been a while. I've been I've been ha- nagging you to get on this thing, and and you've been so gracious. And today, here we are. So thanks so much for coming, Weeksy. Bodzi, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me, and I appreciate your persistence because it's been a a wild time and a crazy time. But congrats on all things good and all the great things you're doing. And hey, listen, you're on the right side of the fence now because. You are a goalie parent, so that's nice. To see. It's about time. And 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 a, and a man with goalie pads myself, I think. I, I understand this. I understand yes. this. Yes. Yeah, that was that was clearly an unfulfilled passion for you. You had to, you had to a, get back in there. I love. I was it. a closet goalie, man. I've been a closet goalie for a long time. You know what's funny? I played with, in addition to you, three other guys. Two of them I won't name, but I'll name Dave Andrewchuk. Dave Andrewchuk down in Tampa. We played together in Tampa, but he does the same thing. So when those guys skate with some of the trainers and some of the staff and they have their daily skate, some of the coaches, he goes in net. And I'll, so it's pretty crazy, man. It's nuts. I don't know. There's something to it. And actually, I've said to guys since I put the equipment on, well, I retired pretty young, right? 30. So like when I came back to Vernon and I was doing the men's league thing, it was, you know, I, I could still play, let's say, right? And it was, sure. so it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't that fun. So I was like, you know what? I've always had this kind of, passion for this goalie thing and I could try my ass off being a goaltender no one's going to get mad at me right because <laughs> you know how that goes when you're competitive right? you, you don't really want to go float around so anyway yeah. so yeah I got the pads and absolutely fell like in love with it and um and really understood from the hockey side of like god I wish I would have done this earlier because like to understand what's difficult for you guys or what plays are hard or sure. you know like what angles are difficult or the release of a shot I was like wow I would have been a better goal scorer if I would have known some of this stuff earlier but uh, you know what's funny because that's why a lot of the a lot of the smart offensive players they pay attention when the goalie coach is talking and then it got from that to some of those guys want to come out and shoot for the goalie coach. So it's funny because Brendan Shanty did that when we played together with the Rangers and Jersey, especially with the Rangers. We'd be out, Henrik Lundqvist and I would be out with their great goalie coach, um, Ben Waller. And Shanty would be like, what guys, I want to come out and I'll shoot on you guys. And I want you to smooth Shanty. I'll, I'll, I'll be there. And, and I was like, Shanty, what are you doing out here, bro? You have 6 million goals. Get the heck out of here. But he <laughs> loved it. He loved it. And Mikey Nylander was doing it. Uh, we had different players that were doing it. And, Zach Parisi was always into it too because his brother was a goalie and played college and played pro for years too, his brother as a tender. So uh, can, the smart guys and, and you being one of them, the only thing is you waited too long, but what's great about it <laughs> is now you can help really with your sons too. Yeah. I'm playing. Right. Wow, it's totally fun. In a different dimension. It's cool. So much to learn too. I mean, the, yeah. you top on that and that's what a lot like this podcast is really a lot about that is like how to navigate the space and uh, right. being curious about the game is such an ad is, is such an ad advantage right for the guys who want to be um you mentioned dave anderchuk and totally off topic but did you know that he has the most power play goals in the history of the nhl yeah history of the national isn't that unbelievable in the history of the national it's incredible that's like my go-to trivia question at parties because it never gets answered right no of course people wouldn't think him no you wouldn't think him of all the goals hall scored in the power play or greta or whoever right like dave anderchuk that's such an awesome little trivia note there i think that's cool um, man, you mentioned too. you're busy, buddy, and you are busy. And I've been following a lot of what you've been doing. It seems like every outlet wants a piece of you, and for good reason. You know, like I, I found out from your interviews that you were the first black analyst ever uh, mm. for for the National League. I, I also yeah. read in, in looking this up that you were the first man of color on Hockey Night in Canada, which was super cool. Mm, and obviously, just I mean, a, a massive ambassador for the game, just in general, and and your career and everything else speaks volumes. So I can understand why people want a piece. But how how has your life been like since this whole thing's been happening? And, and I, I imagine it's been a bit of a pivot for you. Like you, you've been, you've yeah. had to change what the, what the conversation has been about a little bit, I think. Yeah, it's been, you know what, Pods, I'll, I'll start here. First of all, thanks so much. I'd say I'm 45 now. I never thought I'd ever see the day where this would be a mainstream conversation ever. Like, and I've lived now between here in the States and back home in Canada I think I've only lived in Canada five more years. Than, so it's like 20 years that I've lived in the States now. And as an American resident, but Canadian born, Canadian raised, parents from Barbados, I never ever thought I would see this convo at all. And I never thought it'd be mainstream. What's interesting is the fact that it's taken so many atrocities and needless murders and police brutality and things that are so graphic and horrific. That's what it's taken to almost, I don't want to say justify, 
but to allow for the conversation. And I mean, that's horrific. You never want to see anybody murdered, especially at the hands of people that are in place to protect all of us. And I mean, all of us, like every citizen, you know, that's what we believe in. So, you know, we really believe and we're very fortunate in North America. Not only is everybody wants to come to North America and so many people will come in different ways. You know, some people's grandparents came from Ireland, some came from England, some came from Scotland, some came from Russia, some people came in the back 18 wheelers, some people came in freezers, some people came by boat. And you think about that across the board, regardless of your color, um, you know, Italian, Russian, Greek, Portuguese, there's so many different people that are in North America and that have chosen to make North America home over the years. And quite frankly, that have fought for either the US or Canadian or, or allied forces as well, and continue to fight with different last names and different colors and different genders. So, and I mean that from a war standpoint, as far as, far as armed forces. So what's crazy is that even given all that, there never was really a space for a sustained conversation. And now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, due to the needless murders of far too many, but namely George Floyd, Armand Arbery, I mean, we can go on and on, the gentleman in Atlanta, the Wendy's the other day. Now it's, it's forced the conversation. It's really moved the conversation to the front of the stage to where it's not an inconvenient truth for anybody. For those of us that are on the wrong side of it directly or those people that are on the wrong side of it indirectly or for people that it's, it's really hyper uncomfortable for, nonetheless, it's led to now, right now it's the main topic of conversation. So that has changed for me because I never thought I'd see the day where that would happen. And I certainly never thought I'd see the day where that would happen in society, but also in, uh, in our great game and the great game of hockey, I never thought that we'd have a platform for this discussion. Right. No, I mean, well said. And, and I think when, when I'm listening to you speak there and, and it's, it's impossible not to want to hear your voice or the voices of others. And, and I think this, the atrocity of the George Floyd murder ha has meant different things, I think, to different people in different places. And, mm -hmm. and there is a conversation that's going on focused on the, on the cop brutality, right? And, and then right. there's, oh. there's a lot of stuff going, and that's where the protests have started from, and whether good cops versus bad cops. And, and for me, as, as important as that is, mm -hmm. that hasn't been what it's been for me personally. You know, for me, it's been like centered around this game of hockey. And you know, we are on a hockey podcast that, you know, is relevant and to the people here. Sure. It's like, I'm, as crazy as it sounds, it's like, wow, this experience for them, for Weeksy or for, or for Roger Maxwell or for John sure. Craighead or for these guys yeah. that I played with was, was a different experience than mine. Yeah. And I'd never really had crossed that never had fully crossed my mind. Right. Because when we're in, for me, sure. when I was in a locker room, I was just in a locker room. Right. You know, Same. and, and I never really got into that. And I don't think we were probably in a mature enough spot to maybe even have that conversation when we were 20 sure. and playing together. But, um, but that has been what it's been like for me. It was like, now in the context of this sport, do we have a problem? It, was there an issue? Like, did Weeksy feel uncomfortable? Did Roger Maxwell not like coming to the rink? Did he face different scenarios than me? Because I think in the context of, of society, it's very apparent that walking around as a, as a person of color is a different experience in general. For sure. Yeah, right? sure. I, Go ahead, please. No, on. no, but I was just going to say, but, but I mean, I thought that we kind of had this little microcosm. I really, I really did, right? Probably like and completely oblivious to it. I thought that we had this little sweet spot in hockey where the boys were the boys and, and it didn't matter where you came from, but we were, we were together fighting for the same thing. And um, listen to some of the stuff you talked about. It, it sounded like sometimes you didn't feel it and sometimes you did. I'd just love to hear your, your point on, on being a person of color in a hockey locker room th throughout the years you played. Sure. I would say what was interesting is growing up, and you probably heard me say this, but for your listeners and for your audience specifically, Growing up in Toronto, I never, it was never a thing for us, for my family or, or for me, my mom, dad, my younger sister, it was never an issue then. And what was cool is we had a white coach in the late great Mr. Keith Armstrong, who was from Winnipeg and his sons who coached our team and they moved to Toronto. So they coached our team and he had Armstrong's power skating. It was the best thing going in Toronto at the time. And our team had every different background, every different last name, white Canadians, British white Canadians, Irish white Canadians, Filipino, Russian, Greek, Italian, Caribbean, um, Mexican, at the time, Yugoslavian at the time. Like, I, I'm, seriously, That's like cool. if you go down our team program, every year, like Greek, 
Portuguese, we had every different last name. So our team was very international, right? Growing up, whether is that the Red Wings, Toronto Red Wings. So whether yeah. it was minor Adam, Adam, minor PVP, all the way up. But our organization, I'd say, was on the leading edge of that. And the late great Mr. Harper, uh, Mr. Jack Harper, who him and his late wife uh, Carmen, Miss, Mrs. Harper, they were great people. And our home arena, which is still is there now, Chesswood Arena, we never had like. We never had any of those issues per se that were persistent in our organization because it was kind of leading edge that way. And it was very integrated and very inclusive. Now that's not to say that that, that didn't happen in other clubs and other organizations, but I know for ours, we were leading that way. So that was my minor hockey experience. When I got to, when I played some tier can two, I, can I cut in there, Weeksy? Yeah, just so, sure. like, so, so your team is 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 that locker room that I'm talking about, and it felt yeah. very inclusive. But like, awesome. you you did travel to tournaments and go outside of that. Like, was this multicultural team accepted elsewhere? Yeah, because yeah, we were the best on the planet. You know, like we had so many of us that were great players, and so many more guys that should have played in the NHL or could have. I'm positive of that because I know how good they were, and you know, you know them as people. Um, but, you know, life takes you in different directions. Some guys went into business. Um, other guys became entrepreneurs and went into a different vein of business. For some guys, it's more about academics. So, you know, we all have our different life journey that we take. Mm -hmm. But between my, since I was born in 75, as you know, so between our 74 and 75 team, I think there are five or six of us that played in the NHL. So, That's unbelievable. That's awesome. No, thank you. It should have been more. Could have been yeah. 10, could have been 12. But what's cool is the fact that, as you just talked about, like tournaments and stuff, all of our parents were together. So it's not like, okay, well, white Canadian parents are here. White British Canadian parents are over there. Like Italian parents are over there. Like it wasn't that like our parents were all like interwoven. And as players, we were that way too. And then at home back in Toronto, it was the same thing. So I would go to my buddy, Paula DeStazzi's house and his late Nona and his mom, late mom were making sauce or they were making, they were doing peppers in jars or they, they were making lasagna in the basement or whatever. I'm very fluent in that. Do you know what I mean? Just like he would come over to my parents' house and have rice and peas and chicken or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like on the Caribbean side. So there was just this kind of interconnectedness that we had, which really gave us a cultural fluency and an international kind of fluency. And it was cool, man. And I'm friends with him and a lot of those guys to this day, those are some of the best friends and, and my longest established friendships. So that was really neat. But when I got to junior Podsy, it was kind of interesting because for the most part, we had great guys in, in Owen Sound when I got there. But the same thing, we had five of us that went on to play in the NHL, if I'm not mistaken. So we had Keith Primo, Jamie Storm, my goalie partner, Andrew Burnett, over a thousand games, Scotty Walker, Stanley Cup champion. You know, we, and again, should have been more, but we had great guys there on our team. But you would hear guys say stuff during the game. Some guys I was playing against, I was like, did he just, did he just say that? Like, is that real? Like, is this guy for real? And then I remember when we did our rookie initiation at, uh, at our high school in Owen Sound, there was this girl that basically, because you know players had to walk around with their helmets and gloves and we were singing songs or whatever in the mm -hmm. cap. So I had my mask on and this girl basically was getting up in my grill and she's like, well, you look better with your effing mask on, N-word, you look better with your effing mask on. And she kept going on. And I'm like, okay, you better tone it down. And she didn't tone it down. so. I got up in her face and we ended up going at it. And I'm like, no, you can't do this. Like you just can't say this to somebody. It was so, it was the first time that I'd come face to face with that. And it was that raw. Mm -hmm. And literally after that happened in the calf, I walked right into the principal's office. I'm like, listen, I didn't come here for this. Like I came here to play. I didn't come here for this. I don't want to have to go through this. This is foolishness. And the principal's like, Kevin, I'm so sorry. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, you can call the coach. You can call whoever you want. You can call my parents. This happened. I, I'm not going through this anymore to come to school here if that's going to be the case. And the principal couldn't have been any nicer. Right. He couldn't have been any, any sweeter, any more caring and, and uh, empathetic. And she was brought in, I think a day later, she apologized and forced her to apologize. And everything was fine after that. Front. But that was my first kind of like in your face moment in addition to what I hear some guys say. So right. it became more of a reality, I guess, if you will once I got to junior than it did playing like youth hockey back home. So home. there was, so, so that was, you know, there was, con, there was context to hockey, but not necessarily hockey per se. It wasn't, you know, but which is interesting to me when I hear you tell that story, 
did you feel like the boys had your back? Yeah, a lot of them did. I mean, I'm still life lifelong friends with a lot of them. And but a lot of the boys weren't even in the cap at that time. Right. So that's just what I'm thinking. Happy. I'm just thinking if that's happening yeah. and I'm watching and I'm like, am right. I, is Weeksy interface or am I interface? Do you know what <laughs> right. I mean? Exactly. Exactly. That's right. just a natural reaction, right? Like if I totally understand what you're saying, but I had like two, it was two guys that were with me, but I also think those guys were stunned. Right. Because I, they would never, ever think that I'd be able to get that heated. Right. And the only reason I got that heated is because this was that, egregious like who right. does that yeah. and i know for a fact like if you tried that anywhere back in toronto in school it was gonna be a problem with somebody so yeah but but overall my teammates for the most part they were great hey, man those guys a lot of like andrew burnett would lend me his car um he would let he would lend us his his chevy chevette right. he had a chevette this was before i got a car my rookie year i didn't have a car but that year he would lend us his chevette to drive back home to toronto sometimes and you know whatever else and they, for the most part, they're awesome. Luigi Kelchi, Storzy, awesome. um, Mark Villeneuve. Too many guys have mentioned they were great to me. Right. Andrew yeah. Burnett, I love that name. What a, I love his story, right. too. Oh like my in, God. in the minors and crushing it and wasn't getting a chance and then finally gets his chance and goes on to this amazing uh, NHL career. Such 162 a, points for us in junior that year, CHL Player of the Year. 162 points. It's unbelievable. It's he couldn't get a shake for so long, right? Like that's so crazy. Shake. Yeah, couldn't get it. Couldn't get a shake. He was in Washington. They wouldn't give him a shake. Him, Jason Allison, and Anson. Yeah. They were aligned in the A in Portland. Right. And they couldn't get a shake with the with the caps at that time until they finally broke through. Hey, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the Red Wings there. If I'm yeah. not mistaken, you guys came out to Kibbit, did you not? Kamloops International. Yeah, we played, yeah, we played Kamloops. Yeah, we won Kamloops. We love you, Kibbit. You won Kamloops? And was yeah. that um, – was was Sherwood Park there? Do you remember? I think Sherwood Park was there. I think my dad has all the programs, bro. I'm gonna ask him. I mean, so, I I yeah. couldn't find it, and I was trying to find it, right? Because I think yeah. I was a first year that year, and you had yeah. so you had this Toronto team, and we had this team in Sherwood Park that was yeah. ridiculous. Like we had right. Scott Scott Lankow, Damon Lankow, yeah. Yeah. Um, Nolan Pratt. Um, you know, Mark Hurley was it was an, like everyone went to the WHL or college or NHL or somewhere, right? Yep. And uh, so we had the stack squad. team and you That's guys came squad. in and I, yeah, and I thought it was you guys because it was funny. My memory was the black goalie. You right? just beat me because I was drinking some Pedialyte. I was going to say, it was probably only one black goalie pod. You better get this right. Right. Well, so, I would assume, yeah. right? And from Toronto, yeah, 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 yeah. and I think, and I yeah. think it was you. And I guess when we first crossed paths and, and why I bring that up and saying the black goalies, because like that yeah. was what, like out West, like they're just, you know, there's not any exactly. people of color playing, right? Like that was like right. the first time. So it was like, there was recognition there. But again, for me in the, in the, in the eyes, in the, like the context of it wasn't, it wasn't negative or positive. No, it was just different. Was so different. Yeah. So it was acknowledged. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. Um, in, in this day and age, like, is that acknowledgement okay? Now, like, I, I don't know, like, it seems like everything's really touchy. Like, if I was to say that, like, their goalie's black, you know, like, yeah. being a 12-year-old kid again, like, is that is that not okay? Is that okay? Uh, where, where do you stand cool. on something like, like that? It, as long as it's in the right context, which is exactly the way you position it, it's cool because there's an innocence, but there's still a respect. There's a curiosity factor, and it's in no way, shape, or form at all demeaning. So, in right. that sense, it's like, you know, if you go to – I don't know if you were to go to a gym in South Central right now and there's an AAU hoops program and I don't know, the, the shooting guard happens to be a white shooting guard or the point guard happens to be a white guard. Right. Then if he's on a team of all black players or all black and Latino players or players of color, then it's going to be the same thing. Yeah. He's the white guy. And then, and then people are going to say, well, wow, that guy, that white guy is a great hooper, man. That guy can hoop. He's great. He's a great player. And I don't know, maybe it's a reincarnation of Steve Nash. You know what I mean? From BC who went on to do incredible things and be one of the best players in the hall of famer and everything else in a sport where, because of cultural shifting that took place, not everybody looked like him and especially not coming from Vancouver Island to then right. go on to play and, and be as great as he was. So yeah. yeah, I could see that. I could totally see that being the other way if it wasn't a different scenario for sure. I yeah. just, I just asked that because I try and yeah. I'm trying to ask the questions that are like relevant where I'm at. Right. Because I yeah, know that course. people, white people are having conversations and like sure. don't really know how to have the conversation. And it's, and, right. it's, and I don't pretend to know either. Right. But it's like, sure. I think if you're, like you said, if you're coming at it from a human place and I'll use your word like human one Oh one, right. Like yeah. it's, you know, it's, 
it's real and you can be honest, and you can be, uh, you know, authentic with what you're talking about, then, then talk about it because sure. it, it, it does matter. I, I want, I want to shift the conversation a little bit. I heard you talk yeah, about, um, especially last year in the, in the GTHL, you said that there were some issues with one of the coaches and some of the, yeah. some of the things that were being said on the ice and, um, and then what, what does that mean? Right. Like sometimes the referees here, sometimes they don't, maybe a coach hears, maybe they don't like what, what should happen to a player when there's something racially said, like, do you have an opinion on that yourself? You know what, Podsy? Yeah, I do. And here's the thing. I'm a firm believer that no matter who you are, there's a lot of different things you could say. And we could talk a lot of snack and talk a lot of, you know, SHI blah, blah, blank. Like we could talk a lot of that. Anybody, because that's a part of the game. You know, what? you're in the locker room. Players are going to do it. I don't care if it's girls hockey, men's league, adult rec league minors pro there's people are going to talk and, and that's just a part of the game no question and you could say some things and sometimes it gets derogatory but one thing I, I don't ever want to see happen is for anybody to feel be made to feel less than for who they are yeah and and for where they come from you should always be proud of your culture so if you're from vernon you shouldn't feel shame because you're playing in the league for the panthers feel proud of being from vernon you're representing vernon like whatever, you know, that's a part of your history. Yeah. And if you're an Indian player whose parents are from St. Albert, you know, you shouldn't have to feel embarrassed because your last name's Singh. And you shouldn't have to feel embarrassed, like even if you wear a turban or if you were like whatever, like you should never be made to feel less than. So my thing with the GTHL and full disclosure, I spoke to uh, executive director of the GTHL a few days ago, Scott Oakman. And I, I'll be as respectful but pointed with you as I was with him. Diversity is a strength. It's not a weakness. It's a strength. Greater Toronto area happens to be one of the most diverse areas and metropolitan areas on the planet. You can't say that you love the Raptors. You can't say that you love Kawhi Leonard. You can't say that you love Vladdy Guerrero Jr. for the Blue Jays. You can't say all those things and then go to a rink and yell a racial epithet at a black player or a player of color or somebody from a different background or whatever the case may be. First of all, it's hypocrisy. That's the first problem. It's hypocritical. But then secondly, you're now trying to demoralize that person, dehumanize that person, make them feel less than, and that's not okay. So as I said to Scott Oakman, diversity is a strength. Celebrate your, your diversity. Coaches always tell us, and I'm sure you tell your kids, play to your strengths, play to your strengths, play to your strength, use your, use your strengths to your advantage. Diversity is one of those things. It happens to be one of those things. So let's not act like it's a convenient problem when we want to make it a problem. So there's that regarding the GTHL. In addition to that, I'm one of the few guys from that league that played start to finish that's a goalie, let alone a black goalie, let alone, let alone. Now, we get a lot of players coming out of that league more NHL players than any other league in the world. But as far as goalies, we don't really produce goalies from Toronto. We have a problem. <laughs> like we do like we produce players, but we can't produce goalies. That's just the facts in the numbers, objectively speaking. And the reason why I'm saying that is it's that rare, but think of all the kids that are playing that are not going to play in the NHL. And this is their opportunity to play the game, to play single A, to play house league, to play selects, to play triple A major, whatever it is for them. This is their experience and you want it to be a great experience for them and their family, because if it is, then you've got them hooked for life. Right. Yeah. And who knows, as I always say, that girl that's playing, she may very well find the cure for cancer and she may be from there and she may go on to study medicine at UCLA and come up with the cure for cancer, but she grew up playing youth hockey. You yeah. know what I mean? Or her sibling might be a late bloomer. And next thing you know, they're in the net for the Montreal Canadiens. Like you don't really know where things are going to shake out. So it's very important for those rinks to be safe, um, for them to be inclusive, for every player, every attendee, parent, coach, administrator, arena worker to feel safe in those buildings and not be uh, made to feel less than and not let it be allowed from the league level for people to be able to hurl racial epithets at people or derogatory. Well, I was thinking about that. I mean, just trying to, cause I am a coach now in minor yeah. hockey and yeah. it's like, what, how would I handle that scenario? Like what, what, 
one would the coach of that, like the team coach do, like, how do you support those players? Or if, or if it was your own team that you heard somebody say something and the ref never heard it, like, do you, do you walk off the ice? Do you, you know, like it, it, it's interesting, right? Like what, what you, what do you do? And um, it's nice when you have rules in place, but I, I, I was also thinking about the rules because we had a situation last year. And again, I was with Adam. So I'm talking nine and 10 year olds, right? Tra traveling, traveling, a traveling team, the be best team we had in Vernon. Yeah. And obviously the name doesn't matter, but this, this young guy in my team called a kid on the other team a faggot. Right. Okay. And so the ref heard it. Ref did an unbelievable job, said he heard it, came over to the bench, told me what he heard, made the call. It was a gross misconduct, uh, yeah. went to the box. He had to leave. Now, the letter of the law in BC hockey yeah. is, geez, I think it was, I can't remember now, but it was a whole whack of games for Good. a real long time, right? Mm -hmm. And, but long story short, the ref didn't write it in the, in, the, uh, in the game sheet correctly. So it ended up becoming on me as far as what, I'm, what I was supposed to do. I had to discipline my own player. And that, sure. was, a, that was a big responsibility. And what came out of it was, for me, is that the kid didn't even know what a faggot was. Right, he'd heard it at home. Sure, right. It was something that he that he'd heard that he'd heard somebody say, uh, sure. kind of in jest and passing. Whoever knows how the context, and this was something that he thought what he would say on the ice. So now, as a coach of an Adam team, I had to have a whole discussion about slurs for the GLTBQ community, right? Sure, like free man. Yeah, what you can't say, what like what this actually means, right? Like. Sure. So I guess my point is, it's tough when you now mandate rules too, because a lot of times it's not meant like. Yeah, you know, how you were saying, there's some people that will say it and they are trying to bring you down specifically, right? They are yeah. trying to make you feel less. And I think there are some people, and I'll give more credit to the younger people, um, yeah. that they maybe don't even know, right? And right. it's like, so there's an education part involved, I think, that needs to be really relevant as is just opposed from mandating a rule system from the top, mm -hmm. right? I think we need to encourage people to understand what it is that they're saying, why it isn't right to say it. I mean, like all these things that maybe seem natural for a lot of us. But right. I think there does need to be an education process. Do you, do you agree with that? I think education is always cool because we just take away the excuses. You can't say you didn't know. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it helps provide the tools and the framework and the context for understanding um, how and how not, why and why not, if and if not, when and when not. Um, it helps provide that and, and a clear sense of, of what those things kind of represent and how those then govern in and around uh, the realities of what those words mean, what they represent, how they're hurtful right. type thing. So I think that that's really important for sure. The educational piece I think is critical. And then I also feel like the, the enforcement is, you know, it's hard because everybody raises their own kids differently, but you know, I can just speak to my parents and we all go through our own experience, but my parents are old school, new school, new school, old school. And a lot of those values of, you know, be decent, treat yourself properly, respect your last name, respect others, be kind, all these different things, be mannerly, yes, please, no, whatever. Like all that stuff is, is awesome. Um, work hard, hard work's the name of the game, all those different kind of values that my parents would always instill in us. But not everybody has the same framework and everybody has their own iteration of what that does and doesn't look like. So the challenge then becomes, yeah, you could have 15 players on a team, but the accountability factor may vary from household A to household B, from player D to player E. So there's a lot of variance. And then some parents might say, well, that doesn't matter. It's not that big a problem. Like, why is that a problem? So if you, through the education piece, number one, and then the rules in and around it to enforce that, if you put that in, if you put that in place, I think that you're going to have better outcomes. And I know one thing from a GTHL perspective last year, you probably heard me talk about this coach, Matthew Podsy. I don't know if you heard me talk about this guy, mm -hmm. but he's been so awesome. He has six players of color. He coaches minor midget Pickering Panthers back home, double A. And he specifically, he reached out to me to advocate on behalf of his players because he's advocating on behalf of his players. And he said that he'd reached out to the GTHL numerous times, no answer. Uh, OMHA numerous times, no answer. Finally, the OMHA answered him and it's kind of in flux and fluid at this point. But here's the big thing on that. And I went on every platform and I said that, and I'll say it here on yours. There is no bigger cheerleader on planet Earth for the GTHL than me. Anytime I'm on TV, hey man, 
Tyler Sagan, former Toronto young Nat, brah, 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 brah. And that's not just for the GTHL because I'm from there. I'll try to do that for every league. So-and-so played Red Deer Rebels for Brent Sutter or whatever it is, just to give context because that's a part of the journey of who they are. Do you know what I mean? But as I said, and I had a long talk with Scott Oakman, as I said, the executive director of the GTHL, until I see reform, and they just actually released the amount of misconducts um, midweek this week. Actually, sorry, early in the week they did. Or no, late last week they did. They announced the amount of misconducts around verbal misconducts, things that were said, racial epithets, religious, whatever the case may be. And that number is way too high. Yeah. And they missed half of them too. Exactly. And you know what? Here's the thing. But here's what I told him, and I'll say the same thing to you. That can't just be for the players on the bench. And that can't just be for the players you're playing against. That's for your players. It applies to your kids that are playing. It also applies to the parents because don't act like a, a buffoon up in the stands and act like a donkey. You're out of here. Yeah. And if you're out of here, guess what? Your son or daughter that's playing, I don't know, maybe you are the driver in the family. Now maybe they can't get to the rink now. You know, so I, I think it has to extend to not only the people on the playing surface or um, the coaches per se, but the same thing for the, for the, for the fans in the stands. Because I can't tell you how many times to take it back to when I was playing junior, how many times my parents and sister were at a game and some knucklehead would be yelling something, some racial epithet or – Weeks, why don't you play basketball? Weeks, why are you out here? Weeks, weeks, what are you doing? Weeks, why are you out here? Or throw a banana or do something stupid and classless and get away with it. And I see it at the NHL level. And I just had this conversation with Commissioner Bettman, too, who I'm very close to. I'm a huge supporter of. He's been great to me. But I, I told him, like, at every level, from our league, from grassroots, where, you're, where we're talking now, all the way up the pyramid to the NHL level, Fans, players, arena ent- attendees, arena staff, coaches, administrators, anybody. In the event that somebody commits some verbal act of racism, um, again, something levied at the LGBTQ community, whatever the case may be, religion, whatever, you're out. And if you're a fan, I don't care. Don't think that you're coming to an arena or a stadium and then you're so oh, I paid my hard-earned money. Perfect. You just lost it because you're out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Podsy, think about this. We just go to Philly the other day because, as I said, we're 10 minutes outside New York. So down the turnpike south of us, we're in Philly in an hour and 10 minutes. Saturday, let's go for a drive, rubber rock. I love playing in Philly. I loved it. I love playing in the, old, um, in the old spectrum when we're in the A. I love playing against them in the league because the fans, for the most part, they're hype. The atmosphere is great. And you know they always had tough teams. It was going to be a hard-fought game. However, don't tell me that you're cheering for Allen Iverson for the Sixers. And you're like, yeah, AI is the man. We love AI. The answer, we love him. We love him. Donovan McNabb's your quarterback. For the, we love D. McNabb. We love Mc, And next thing you know, me or another player of color is playing against the Flyers, and you're yelling a racial epithet. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that is the ultimate stupidity, but also hypocrisy to the highest degree. Yeah. Yeah, sure. no, it makes no sense. And it's, you know what I mean? Yeah, it has no place. And it's, I mean, we, we, no we yeah, we're, we're smarter than that, um, yeah. you know, as a, as a culture, as a nation. And right. I, I mean, hopefully that's where this thing goes is like really getting it right. Like getting it on the, on like really at the roots level, right. That it's not, that's exactly. not just a jab. You know what I mean? It's just something that shouldn't be yeah. said. Right. I mean, it's right. just, there's no place for it. So just, Oh, there's so many jabs that you get. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. You can't stop a puck, stop the puck, whatever the case may be. I don't know whatever your five holes this or whatever somebody's trying to say but there's a lot of things that you can say and you know whatever it's fun yeah. you can talk a lot of smack but speaking yeah. of five hole i see you repping the brand there and my boy's got repping. the no five yeah, exactly. going too, yes, so i gotta yes. mention that yeah check thank out you, weeks no five hole apparel really cool stuff um Appreciate awesome that, man. awesome thank slogan. you, thank well, you. let's get into um before we run out of time here, because I totally want to talk about your career because, I mean, everyone, well, not everyone, a lot of people don't know you just because of what you're doing now, you know, like right. you're an analyst and you've been doing this for now a long time, right? Like 10, 11 years, if I got that right. So, yeah. so sometimes we can forget about the player behind the analyst now. And, sure. and um, you definitely had a crazy run and yeah. I've never had a chance to talk with you about that run. You know, we, we were drafted by the same organization, Florida sure. and went to the rookie camps and, yeah. and went to the training camps. And, you know, we were kind of, there was, there was a few of us there like me, yourself, 
Nemo, Washburn, yep. Ryan Washy. Johnson. There was kind of yep. like that. Uh, those were probably the five guys that we kind of hung out pretty tight because we were sort of the guys highest on the radar. And well, Chris Armstrong was among that group too. Yep. Was was yep. Army was hanging around too. And um, but then we kind of I mean, as hockey does, um, yep. we end up going our separate ways, you know. And then you know, I was, I was just looking at 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 your hockey DB and my goodness, yep. like after I left. So I mean, we were together in um, where was it in Carolina. So, yeah, so we're, we're, we're playing pro yeah. in Carolina together yeah. and what an experience that was playing for Richie Crom. Um, mm-hmm. we're down there and, mm-hmm. and doing our thing in Greensboro, which you know, I mean, is the farthest place. I've said this a lot of times from like right. a hockey city you could ever possibly imagine, sure. right? Like it was sure. nuts. And then I got traded to Toronto. So then I was gone and then you, you went all over the place and, and we kind of both had a similar experience with that. My first pro year, I played for four different teams. Yeah, man. Like, that's crazy. I mean, at the time, yeah. I, you know, at the time it was just what it was going on. You know, I was 20 years old, just exactly. turned 21 and, and I, you didn't know any difference. So you just did the best you could. But now looking back on that, I'm like, holy smokes. And then I look at you and you were playing, you had seven teams in four years, man. Yeah. Like, like, how was that? Like, you, you mean that climb and, and like, what was, just talk about that experience, the trades, the, the up and downs, trying to find your spot. Like, how, how, how was that for, for you uh, back in the 90s there? Well, I mean, American League was great for us, as you know, because we, we got to play a lot. And for me, specifically as a goalie, I played a lot in Greensboro. Um, Fort Wayne was awesome. Ironically, um, it was crazy. My girl's mom's from Fort Wayne, which is wild, uh, even though they grew up in Alberta. But <laughs> Fort Wayne was really, really cool in the old IHL. Detroit Vipers were awesome playing for John Torchetti, who was also with Fort Wayne, and Steve Ludzik and Rick Dudley, that crew. They're great people. And what was wild about is in the minors, both the American League and the IHL, you know, the I was an older league back then with more guys that had NHL experience, more NHL veteran guys that were still playing or guys that had a cup of coffee that were still playing that were good players. So it was was an older league than the A. But in saying that, what was weird was you were never really getting comfortable. So for me, and I mean comfortable as in, like, okay, I'm settled in here. I'm settled in here. So for me, it was like, okay, man, I'm auditioning. I'm auditioning. I'm playing for my teammates. We want to do as well as we can, but I'm auditioning. I'm auditioning. I'm auditioning. And I, I looked at it that way. And I know, especially in my time in the eye with some of the former NHL guys I play with, they're like, Weeksy, you don't always have to be at the rink. Weeksy, you don't have to lift weights. Weeksy, you're a goalie. You don't have to work out, like whatever. And I was just never allowed myself and circumstances never dictated to where I could just kind of put my feet up. You know what I mean? So it was always like on this treadmill and on this treadmill and on this treadmill. And then getting into the league was really no different. Like playing with Florida, I'll always be grateful to the late Brian Murray and and the folks down in Florida who gave me my shot. And, but even still, it was never like, okay, you're here, but you're here, but you're here. Cause even after I was kind of there, then they're like, ah, well, we're not going to sign you to a one way. I'm like, what are you talking about? Norm Miracle has a one way. Kevin Hodson has a one way. Jamie Storr has a one way. So-and-so has a one way. What do you mean? Like, come on. And then I had, that's when I had to go back to Fort Wayne. So Brian Murray said to me, God bless his soul. He's like, Kevin, if you go down there and you rip it up, I'll, I'll trade Mark Fitzpatrick. You'll be back. And then that's what happened. And then contract that summer, two-way contract. I'm like, so anyhow, I, I, I force a trade. I go to Detroit in the eye. I'm IHL goalie of the year and half a year. I go to Van... I'm feeling good in van, feeling good, but can't get a win. Couldn't get a victory. Couldn't get an NHL win. Couldn't get – and then it started to be like this groundswell. And then all these people were like, oh, the guy can't win a game. Oh, well, that's it, which is factually true. Um, but in some of those games, I played well. I just couldn't get the result. So that was hard to kind of get, get my footing at the NHL level in that transition. And then finally it hit, and we won our home opener that year against the Rangers. And then from there, it started clicking. And next thing you know, like, I didn't really like the vibe. It wasn't really the right fit for me. I knew that they wanted Dan Cloutier in the first place. And they trade me. And that was hard because it's the first time that I've ever, like, been smeared publicly after I got traded. Yeah, so, well, hold on. Re- rewind, rewind. Yeah. Because I want to – because there's some good stuff there. Like, yeah. one is, like, trying to get there, which yeah. which I've spoken a lot about on this podcast because it's yeah, damn know. hard. It's damn totally. hard to get your opportunity, one, 
And then, yeah. it's, and then it's hard, like you say, the audition process back then, I don't feel it's anywhere near what it is now. Oh, not I mean, even close, Fadzi. Yeah, meaning that you get the call yeah. and no one's talking to you. Just go out there and sink or swim and figure it out and do the best that you can, right? 100%. I definitely felt that. And so in that, in, that, in that audition arena, right, yeah. that you're, you're trying to obviously do the best you can when things don't go the way you want them oh. to. Right. And so like you oh. now, like, I mean, I, I looked and I, I'm, I'm kind of happy you brought that up. You, you began your NHL career 0, 13 and two. Yeah. I mean, that's 15 right. games. That must've felt like 115 games. It felt like 3000 games. Right. It did. So like, and here's what was hard about that. Right. Is so some games and you know this too, but some games you're like, man, I felt really good tonight. And then you're a game star and then you're a game star again. But then it kind of doesn't matter because we're in the results league and the end result is you're not getting the win. So I'm like, frig, man, this is something's just not, I don't know. So then there are other games where I'm like, oh man, I'm just completely overwhelmed and not overwhelmed from a skill standpoint, but more psychologically. And I don't exactly. And what's crazy is sometimes you're playing, especially as a younger player back then, because as you just alluded to the entry the entry process is so different now than it was then because our league's so much younger now than it was then. But you know this too, like all the hockey cards, all the posters in your room, bra bra bra. I'm like, man, I'm playing against Grant Fear tonight. Whoa, it's Mike Richter tonight. You know what I mean? Like, it's Dom Hat. We're playing Buffalo. It's Hashik tonight. Oh, it's Gretz and the Rangers and Mess tonight. This is before I played with Matt. Like, so all these different kind of things, they just added needless weight to you psychologically. And then of course, in our, in our position as a goalie, when you have that, now you're impeded, you're kind of locked up. You can't free flow as much. And now every shot, instead of every shot being you're flowing and you're making your saves and you're feeling good. It's like, I gotta make it. I'm going to make it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So biomechanically speaking, you, instead of flowing and being fast, I'm tight and a little more restrictive in being fast. And until I got that first win, and we, you know, we beat the Rangers at home open or it was a hockey night in Canada game or whatever. And until that happened, then I was like, okay, you know, and then I started kind of rolling a little bit from there and, and knew, knew, knew and could taste. It was tangible. No, that I could play in the league right. at that point. So then as far as like, but that's a big, I mean, I don't want you to get going there because that's, I mean, I've heard a ton of guys talk about that is the yeah. fact of like when that moment arises and sometimes for guys, it is like a moment where it's like, yeah, I am supposed sure. to be here. Right. And some guys oh, yeah. kind of, you know, it's not a light bulb thing, but so that was like, was it the win that, that we were like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the right spot. Of course it was the win because then from then they couldn't really, they couldn't say anything about that anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you start winning some more games and you're playing better and you're winning some more games. And then, they couldn't really, that wasn't, that wasn't something that they can attack you for. And I only say attack because it, sure, it's a conversation point, it's a fact. So that's fine. But you also know when people are coming to you and you know when certain media types are coming to you and you know when they're jabbing you and they're pinpricking you. Do you know what I'm saying? And I've said this before, like, I know when people would come up to me and I'll never, I'll never dignify them. But I know when people would come up to me and they'd be like, hey, Steve, like, so Steve, you uh, let them two through the five hole, Steve. They, Steve, they didn't look really good. And I'm like, bro, you know my name. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, going to claim ignorance you know, on that one. What is, what is, why would they call you Steve? Just to try to get my goat. Just call you the, oh, just be like, kind of like you're not important enough for me to know your name? Steve Weeks, former goalie. Different color. Oh, he was a Different former goalie. Spelling. Okay, sorry, different sorry. Point, I, that, color, I didn't right? have that. I didn't. I didn't have that. Dark yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, okay. but what's wild about that is, I know when they were doing it, and I know when it was a an absence of mind or a little brain cramp. But I also know when people were doing it. So Steve, so right. Steve today, yeah. and I'm like, okay, so now you're trying. Now you're trying to get at me now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's disrespectful, and I would never ever think to call anybody like if you have nicknames for your teammates or whatever you know call you pods or podsy or whatever a guy would be like hey pods though what's up like whatever that's different but i would never all of a sudden call you alistair like your name's not alistair <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> i'd be like hey alistair hey man bring some of the gatorade over here in the room hey alistair come on over here man 
or you come back to the freaking bench and you go top shelf with your drag <laughs> cleats and you shoot your cross body top shelf shot that you shoot. And I'd be like, Alistair, great shot, bro. That like, great job, man. Like, who does that? Right. You know? So yeah, that was uh, it was an interesting time and it was very turbulent that way. And uh, luckily I had a great support system and I do. And you know, my parents and sister and some of my closest friends, there's a lot of late night phone calls and you know, they're, they couldn't have been any more uh, nurturing, real, but loving and, and caring at the same time, man. Hi there. Just want to take a short break from the conversation with Weeksy to ask you for your support. And if you are enjoying these conversations and the guests that I'm able to deliver here on Up My Hockey, that you do your part to, one, review the episode on the platform that you listen on or to share it on your social media or to talk about it with friends because that is the best way to grow this, to get this message and these conversations into more ears and minds and hearts. And that's what this is all about, as you know, is about really capturing the the human aspect of the sport and the person behind the player and and what we all go through in order to make our dreams become a reality so please if you would like to help me if you're if you're a supporter uh, and listener of this show please do your part and let others know that uh, we got something good going on here and and i would really appreciate that uh, and we'd be very grateful for your support so now we'll get back to the conversation yeah it's interesting you talk about that because that was one thing that I, that i have spoke about on here before is that feeling of loneliness oh. in, in, in a in a weird in a way that's like because you're surrounded by guys and I was right. always and I don't know how you felt about it but like for me I was always auditioning less for the guy and maybe that was one of my issues like less for the the people that are actually making the decisions like my coaches and the GMs but more for my teammates like I was always. auditioning for them right and I wanted I wanted to have these guys respect me and I wanted them to know me. And I, that was really, really important to me my entire, my entire career. But in saying that, and I did think I had some really good friends. We, we never chatted like this. No, you know, the like there was such that there wasn't the atmosphere didn't lend itself. Right. To it. And I, I know, and yeah. I, and I feel kind of responsible for not maybe asking the questions or having the conversations, but in, in that environment. So now we're all these guys trying to get to the same place or, or, or kind of right. experiencing the same struggles or problems, but yet not talking to anyone. And then my mom and dad, for me, were amazing and super supportive, but didn't, I mean, I, I couldn't really have a conversation with them about what I was going through. Sure. Because I didn't think that they got it, you know? So like, right. did, did you feel that even I mean, you must have felt it. Did you feel even more so? Maybe, I guess, how can you compare my experience to your experience? But would it be, would it be magnified a little bit now because of the color of your skin as well and yeah, a goalie as well? That, you, you just nailed it. The color of my skin, for sure. The fact that I'm a goalie, for sure, sure, on top of it. So you compound those two things and it's a thing, you know, right. and it's a lonely place to navigate being a goalie in and of itself. It's very kind of isolating. And, you know, obviously you put so much pressure on yourself because you want to be there for your teammates, you know, whether your team Canada women's team USA women's here, Olympic team, whatever it is, girls, peewee, triple A, like it doesn't really matter. Like I always say, like even, even some of the parents, <laughs> some, of, uh, some of the parents on my team playing minor hockey, like I could see myself being like clear as crystal right now, being nine and letting in a goal. And seeing some of my parents' teammates, some of my teammates' parents be like, what's Kev doing? <laughs> Come on, Kev. You got to have that one. Like, what are you doing? Like, I can see it, like, clear as crystal right now. Right. I can feel it. I can hear it. I can see it. And whatever. It, it never really faced me at the time. But I'm just saying that, that that's the reality of the position, right? And I remember when we were playing, and you were with us by then, when we were playing in Philly, one game in the old spectrum, in the American League. And I don't know how well you remember the Philly Phantoms, the Flyers HL team, but that team was a pseudo kind of quasi NHL team. They were good. They were good. And Peter White, if I'm not mistaken, was on that team. He was sick. They had some sick players. Backlab Prosball was on that yeah, team. Beat, right, too. White, exactly. They were tough too, man. They, they were exactly. tough. Yeah. That was the squad, right? And I remember we got down early. We were getting peppered because it's not like we were like a defensive team. And so many of you guys were so skilled offensively, but – we were getting peppered. We were down two. And I'll, I'll, I'll never forget, I won't say his name, but one of our D-men, who was a veteran D-man, came, <laughs> came back after the ref took the puck out of the net. And you know, sometimes you'd come back, you'd be like, 
hang in there, big boy, or whatever it is, man. <laughs> we got you. Like, you like, we're with you, bro. Don't worry, man. Hang in there, big boy. <laughs> this guy came back. He's like, are you letting these in on purpose? <laughs> like, like, are you letting these in on purpose? And I don't know if you remember it, but I, I bro, in the locker room, in the dressing room, in the intermission, He's like, Weeksy, like, I know that we're not whatever, but are you letting some of these in on for, like, what's going on? So, so, so that, that kind of crystallizes the position. Yeah. And you know what sucks about that, too, is that's if you're in the net. Okay, but if you're on the bench and you know this to be true, if one questionable goal kind of goes in, the boys are like, ah, okay, whatever. If a terrible goal goes in, you might see a guy like kick the bench with a skate or whatever. But if it's like two or three of those, guys would be like, I dagger me up. We see what's this guy doing? This guy's allergic to the pill tonight. He's allergic. What's going on with this guy? This guy couldn't stop a cold. Like, what's up? Well, get him out of there. Go get like, and it just puts you like in an awkward spot. You know right, what I mean? Because he's your boy too. Because he's your boy. Or, or yeah. it's, you know, it's female players or whatever. That's your girl. Like you. You're trying to, you want to be there to support her, but you yeah. know that she's having a rough go of it. So all of that to say the position, the dynamics of the position are weird. And yeah. then you add the fact that I was a black goalie. It made it interesting for a lot of people. And, and uh, for some media types, they, they weren't quite as objective or as fair or as clean in how they went about it. But then there are so many other people like Chico Resch, John Davidson, um, Doc Emmerich, Sam Rosen, like, you know, and I just happened to mention some of the best of the best. Uh, Trip Tracy and Johnny Forslund down in Tampa. You know, they were such good people, you know, and they treated me so well. They're great to my family and they're great people to this day. And some of them are still friends. So, uh, awesome. you know, the difference, you know, yeah. the difference. You've yeah. been around, you know, the difference. Oh, no, for sure. Yeah. You mentioned the spectrum. I just have to, you mentioned it a couple of times. That's where I scored my one and only uh, goal against Hextall in the spectrum. No way. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so cool. cool. Yeah, no, it was a spectrum. Yeah, they were still there. So, uh, or did they go to, so when did they go cool, to the Coach State Center? Because that's where they're at now, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, they're in uh, Wells Fargo, what's called now. But they've but, changed uh, okay. it a few times, yeah. Right. So, so yeah, that, that was in right Philadelphia. Right. Philadelphia's yeah. fond for me. Um, any, so, like, you were involved in some big trades there early on, and I, I don't want to – it's tough because you're curious so sure. long. I don't want to fast forward over anything. No, but, no, I mean, right, like, that, that, that right. initial time with the big trades, and you're, you're with Jovo in that one from Florida yeah. – you mean, well, then you end up moving over to um, to the island with Scatcher and McCult for yep, Putman, right? That that zoom in. Mm -hmm. And that, if, if if I got my my stuff correct, that was when you became their number one. Like, that was the first time you were num number one, correct? When you went to the island? You yeah, got no, number one minutes? Yeah, Butchie Goring, the great Butch Goring, Islanders legend, of course. Uh, Butchie was our coach. And it was Steve Valiquette and myself and Valley and I are great friends to this day. Valley went on to play. He's an analyst here in New Funny, York. I played with Valaket in uh, Bridgeport. Right, right. Yeah. so you'd know. Yeah. So Valley uh, went on, had a really good career himself. But Valley was really helpful to me. The great Roberto Luongo was there. And what was wild about it was, Podzi, is these guys were already playing a different style. These guys, and I mean goalies-wise. But I was playing really well. And then um, Butchie's like, you're playing. Like, I'm running you. You're playing. You're playing. So – that's another thing. When you play intermittently as a young goalie, it's very difficult. You almost have to take your licks and get in there and just see if you could survive it, man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the more often you play, it's like golf. It's such a feel intuitive sport. The more often you play, the better you tend to become. Okay. And I found that to be the case with not only myself, but a lot of other goalies. So I was playing more often. I was playing well. We'd play the Rangers, have a big game, play Toronto, have a big game, play the good teams, play really well. And now I'm like, okay, I've got this thing. I've got this. I've, I'm rolling. And, but what was wild is in practice, I'd be watching Valley or Luongo and these two, and especially Luongo because he's a future Hall of Famer and he went on to be so great. It looks so much easier to them or for them when I was watching them at the other end of practice. I'm like, I'm diving, I'm jumping, glove save, back over, kick save, back, whatever. I was super hyper fast. You know what I mean? Like hyper fast. Yeah. But those guys were like, well, I'll say, especially Roberto, butterfly, blocker to the corner. Next. Okay, over here, glove save. Next. One save, butterfly recovery, short push, no big deal. 
So then I was like, the way this position is being played is really different. And I'll always thank Valley for this because Valley and I, Valiquette and I had a conversation and I'm like, Valley, what's up? He's like, and you know, Valley, cause you know, Valley's kind of surfer duty. And Val's like, you know what we see like my goalie coach back home in Toronto, like Sudsy, like, and I'm like, <laughs> Who's the Sudsy guy? tell me about him. And Valley was kind of, and Valley was kind enough to share with me, to share Sudsy's number. And I called Sudsy and we had this long conversation. And I swear to God, from that off season, through every other year that I played, I would work with Sudsy in the off season. I'd rent ice. I'd go, and that's how I started learning butterfly style. So I had to learn all this while I was already in the league. Keep in mind, Luongo was fluent in this, working with Francois Allaire and those guys, and Benny Allaire since he was like 13, right? And the same thing with Fichaud and the same thing with Theodore and what became the hottest factory in the history of the NHL for, for producing goalies, which is Quebec. Yeah. That's why that became such a hot factory for those guys. So I had to learn that at the NHL level. It was really humbling, but um, it helped me so much. And Sudsy helped me, and he helped me prolong my career and go on to play as long as I did. Without working with him, like literally, Paziano, say, say it's Monday, July 25th. And he'd drive from the other end of the city. I'd rent the ice at 8 in the morning. He'd organize two shooters, and we'd be out there for an hour and an hour and a half just doing drills. So it was like advanced goalie school for me in learning what some of the a lot of the Quebec guys had naturally learned. I was learning it at the NHL level, but it helped me so much. So I'll always be grateful to Valley and uh, and the great Roberto Longo because they I love your life. Valley impersonation. You can call me anytime and just do, do that <laughs> do that for me. Oh my God, that just put me right back in front of him. He's what a great dude. Like we we had like awesome dude. Top yeah, I mean, it's cat. so amazing, right, how hockey, like, we just crossed so many paths. Like, you know, Luongo yeah. I played with, Valquette I played with, you know, obviously Jovo right. I played with. Like, I, even on your Vipers team, like Bobby J and Brad Shaw and Stefan Ustorf were all on oh. that Vipers team that you were on. Then when I was playing for Great, the Vipers, man. Brad Shaw was my coach and Bobby J was the assistant coach. Like, no uh, way. Yeah, super That's crazy, right? crazy. Yeah, it's just nuts. That's so two great defensemen and, and great dudes, man. And Shazi, as you know, is an assistant coach with Columbus right now yeah. and does an awesome job with their D he's done a great job. Look at Wierenski and how far he's come. You look at Seth Jones, how far he's come and uh, oh, a great man. Yeah. I want to touch on, um, that's the thing with these, with these conversations. It's crazy. Cause you find out so much. Like, I think that's amazing. You're at the NHL level mm -hmm. and you decide that you're either missing something or it looks like it's not quite as easy as you. And I got to classify this for the, for the, for those listening yeah. too, like who don't know sure. you, cause you, you say hyper fast, but I mean that you were athletic, like you're an athlete period. Right. Like that's when I think of Kevin Weeks, I think right. athlete, I mean, you were in the net sure. and you were just quick, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, there might be a hole there, but you'd find a way to stop it. And, and there was necessarily no, you know, technique to it. It was just, you were going to exactly. stop the puck. Right. So right. now you're at this, you're in the NHL. That's what kind of what you've, obviously, I would assume that your self-esteem, your self-identity mm -hmm. is all wrapped around the fact that you're quick, right? You're cat-like, yeah. you're, you know, you're all these things. Totally. And now you're like, oh, I need, maybe need to change something here. Like, was that on you yeah. yourself to say, yeah, I got to improve or I got to change? Or was that somebody else telling you? And, and amazing that you did that and made that move. That was on me, Pods. It wasn't on me because I, you know, I like to be objective and I like to be real and I like to be fair. And sometimes it's not always convenient. And that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily jive with per se, unless you're wired the same way. Yeah. And something that I knew in watching other sports and playing other sports, but especially watching other sports, I knew that the greatest of the great, even before, even while he was in his career, say Michael Jordan, he was always getting better. Always. There's always a new skill. There's a new dimension to his game. There's something else. He's added a new element and he's just adding different stuff to his tool bag, so to speak. So I'm like, wow, okay. And then you, know, you watch other athletes in other sports, Jerry Rice or whoever the case may be. And then of course, Tom Brady later on came in, Colby came in, Colby followed uh, MJ's blueprint right down to his great trainer, Tim Grover, who, you know, I've had on the yeah. show. And you started to see Tiger then came in. Same thing. Like, hey, think about Tiger. So, but like right. Tiger won the U.S. Open by 15. And that summer he decides to reinvent his entire golf swing. It's like, hold me. What? Like, this is it. This yeah. is it. So I started to see that. And, and think of Mess. Like, I play with the great Mark Messier, okay? And Mess 
tonight. I don't care. What are we? What's the day? Let me check my iPhone. 16. June 16th. If they put ice in Madison Square Garden tonight and Mess had to play, Mess would go out there and play. And play, play. I don't mean play. I mean play. But as great as he was and is, I know he's retired from playing. I'm going to try new skates today, man. Brand new out of the box, Podzi. <laughs> like, okay, I got these CCMs. And then you see him like kind of slaloming in the corner in practice. You'd be like, ah, all right, let me get the Graf 703s. All right, let me get the 705s. Okay, let me get the Graf 707s. All right, let me get the Bauer Supremes. Okay, let me get the Bauer this. Let me get – Mess was always tinkering. So that was my first experience with playing with like one of the best that ever lived. And I saw that mess was, it was always something. There was a quest to add. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I was saying, like, let me add something in my tool bag. Let me get something else. Let me work on something else. And his skating was perfect. His edge work, his stride length, every single thing, his cadence, everything was perfect how mess skated. It's almost like he was floating on the ice. He wasn't like hard in the ice. And everybody had, we all skate our own way. Yeah. But he was so efficient he was still trying to find new skates all the time or right. something different. So yeah. then we, that was kind of my first brush with that, but I saw that there's always room to get better. Yeah. And that's really what, what I kind of looked inward at and seeing that, Hey man, I'm in the league. It's cool. It's cool. I'm signing autographs. Yeah. My gear looks sweet. My mask looks sweet. That's also cool. I'm playing with some awesome teammates. I love it. I've got money in my pocket. That's cool. You know, whatever, like I, I can help change the course of my family. That's also cool but I want to win a Stanley cup, but I have to get better yeah. and I have to keep getting better. And that was, I was always wired that way as a kid, but I think that's one of the best parts about not having immediate success for me uh, by way of uh, record in playing in the NHL is it just kind of fueled that even more. And I had mm -hmm. to stay hungry and then being around great players. And you know, this from yourself, when you're around those guys and you're around those people, you see the way they're wired and it never stops. It never stops. They're always in that quest to try to get better. So I was real about that with myself, my whole playing career right. and TV for that matter. Yeah. I mean, I hear you talk about that. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's the way to live. It's a way of life, right? I mean, it's totally is yeah. it's, it's how you want to do things and, and, and the approach. And you I mean, you touched on a few things, your environment massively matters. Um, and I want to sure. get into that in the, in the hockey, if we have time, like just being from yeah, teams so that weren't a part of playoffs to being a team that were a part of playoffs, like, that environment is massively different. And I felt it for, uh, on my own experience. Yep. Um, but I want to go back just a little bit about that identity thing. Because sure. I think there's a lot of players that listen to this, young guys that are, that are coming up or even, you know, guys yeah. that are playing right now. And you, you, have a, oh, you have an idea of who you are and what you think you're good at and how, how you're going to fit in uh, to whatever level that you're, you're trying to get to. I was roommates, sure. uh, I'll, I'll bridge this gap here. I was roommates with, with Rick DiPietro. Yeah. And, uh, and so Ricky had Billy Smith. Yeah. Uh, as, did which, as did you, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. he ended up going to the aisle, right? Yeah. Yep. And, um, and Billy Smith, and we loved Billy Smith, right? Loved of his course. stories. We loved everything about Billy Smith. Awesome. I have no idea what he was like as a goalie coach, so I can't, sure. I can't speak to that. But I remember speaking with, with Rick about the fact that Billy wanted him to play a completely different way. Sure. And what then what had gotten him the first overall draft pick in the NHL draft? Of course. Of course. So now there was this thing, right? Do you be resistant to that? Do you right. lean into it and say, yeah, I should listen here? Like, I, I just thought that was a, like, and now more, as a man looking back on that, you know, uh -huh. as, as a kid wrestling with that, right? Is, am I good enough the way I am? Do I need to improve? Should I take this? It's uncomfortable for me. Um, sure. How do you feel about that? Like, do you have to trust where it's coming from first and foremost, or does it really have to be innate to you? Do you have to believe it before you kind of lean into it? Um, I think what's so critical is knowing exactly who you are and being at peace, knowing who you are. And as mentioned, Tim Grover, Jordan's trainer says that, uh, and the late great Kobe Bryant and, and others, he always says that know exactly who you are. And I'm a big believer in that. You have to, and I said that to you at the beginning, you're from Vernon, know that you're from Vernon, know who you're from, know where you're from, be at, at peace with yourself, feel good in your skin as a human. And then you parlay that into you as a player, or as an athlete, I'm a big believer in that because once some of those boxes are unticked or you're a little insecure in those things, 
it's going to play itself out in other things, you know, and it doesn't typically play itself out in a way that'll be positive for, for any of us. So once you have those things taken care of, then as a player now, Hey, I know I'm this player, but I got to be real about the type of player that I am. For, for example, I have to play to my strengths and I'll build on, I'll build on my strengths, but I'll also build on my deficiencies or my weaknesses. If this is a blind spot for me, or I'm not as comfortable setting up on the post, or I don't know for you, are you as comfortable on the wall on your backhand, taking a puck and trying to get it out of the D zone, whatever, all those different things. Yeah. But we can build on those things, right? Yeah. As long as our minds are in the right place and we're not like, no, I don't need that. Or no, it's not like that. But here's where the hard part comes to your question. Because you mentioned this with Ricky. And, you know, I've had this with different goalie coaches at different points too. Is philosophically, you don't always see the, the, the things and the game and how you play through the same lens as somebody else. But here's the hard part. Is that person has authority. Yes. You yes. get what I mean? Yes. So That's my the problem. Case, I had that, I, so in my case, I had that as a goalie coach too. And, or, or as a goalie from goalie coaches, excuse me, as well. I had that. And where that's concerned, sometimes you're like, oh, man, I know that that's not the way it's got to go. But sometimes you just smile and say, yes, okay, no problem. And other times you're like, okay, all right, all right, thanks for sharing that. And then other times you might not say anything. And then sometimes you got to stand up for yourself and just say, hey, man, I, I, whatever. My knee doesn't work that way <laughs> or whatever the case may be. You might have had a yeah. ACL reconstruction in, freaking in the minors. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And now you're still playing. You're like, hey, I just don't have that flexibility and range of motion in my knee, as an example. Yeah. It wasn't my case, but just uh, hypothetically speaking. I just it is tough, that. though, right? Like that's, like, that's the tough one, especially in that of position. Course. I could imagine, right? You have this of guy course. that that's on the phone right after practice telling the GM, you know, well, he was, you know, he's not listening. Or he's, and you know that's happening. So you're still trying. You want to be the best goal you can be, but it's, it's like fine. it totally is psychological. And it's I've had that before, Posse, where people will say, here's what's hard, right? It's like. If the message is authentic and the message is accurate and the facts are the facts, they are what they are. Those yeah. are indispensable. When they're not the case, and even if you are being told certain things and you know factually that what you're being told is incorrect, if you don't listen or you don't go along with what they want you to go along with, this guy's a bad apple. Yeah. He's a bad egg. It's a bad egg. Can't does doesn't want to be coached. That type thing. So that's a very fine line that you have to walk, and it's hard. And I'm glad that you asked that question because as a young player, you never want to give up unless you are actually kind of a bit of a donkey. You never want to give off that vibe. You know, you want to be a sponge. You want to take as much knowledge as you can as you can intake, and you want to try to apply as much of it as you can in your own individual game to make you better. But you do know in certain instances when what you're being told isn't accurate. And then if you disagree with that, well, you're a, he's a bad guy. He's angry. He's aggressive. He's all these different things. Like he's on his own page. He's a freelancer, right. you know, that type of thing. So just know that no matter what you do, sometimes people are going to say that, but you know what you need as a player. Right. Um, I'm going to go there just on that because I could say that about, I could have like what you just said there. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I could, I could say, I could retell that story and say, yeah, so-and-so never liked me because he thought that I was resistant, this, that, and the other. But when I'm, when I would be saying that I would yeah. never in my head have race as an indicator of why they would be saying that. Oh yeah. Have yeah. you ever, have you ever like had like what you just said right now, maybe that scenario, have you ever thought that maybe this guy is saying that because you're black and not yeah. because of the resistance that you're giving? Yeah. There are instances where that was the case for sure. Personally and professionally for sure. Right. Or, you know, see, I, we were never, I was never raised to try to like control or manipulate people or whatever the case may be. Like uh, we always try to help. I always try to help. Hey man, this, or Hey man, this protein. Hey man, I don't know when we're trying to get muscle creatine. Hey man, Epsom salts baths or whatever it is. Cause from a place of sharing, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. and you know, different teammates, we all have different stuff. Like, I was using plyo bands at Jack Goodlad Park in Scarborough before they were a thing. Do you know what I mean? Like I was doing bench hops and uh, all these plyometrics, which Russian players were doing, or maybe the Swedish players were doing. You get what I mean? Or yeah, maybe yeah. the tech guys were doing, but it wasn't really a thing over here in North American hockey. That kind of stuff. 
just as an example. So, you know, if you share stuff or whatever, it comes from that place. But there are times when for people on the other side, they want what they see, they say to be what it is. And in the event that you resist, well, this guy's a bad egg. Or if they're trying to manipulate you or take advantage of you or give you misinformation and you say something, see, we told you he's angry. Right. So that's kind of the slippery slope where, um, you know, you always have to stand up for yourself. You always have to stand up for yourself in a way that's respectful, in a way that's decent. But for some of those people that are the perpetrators and kind of have that type of mentality, whether you say it with honey, lavender honey from the Okanagan Valley, whether you say it with fresh strawberry jam from Tabor, Alberta, whether you say it with whatever, it's going to be a problem because the fact that you're resisting what they are trying to impose upon you. Right. And that's a challenge. And I've had that for sure. Right. I've had that personally and professionally. Yeah. And for me, I, I think that that, like you said, slippery slope. And I think that's slippery for you, I would assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, because, yeah. because it is somewhere in your brain that there, this could be racially motivated somehow. Like, and then like to figure out whether that is or not, like even the fact that you have to contemplate where this is coming from, what the motivation is, is a slippery slope, right? Because sure. it, it very well might not be and it very well could be. And the fact that I, in my scenario, I had a ton of crappy things that happened to me in hockey, sure. but I would never once would it was like, well, maybe he doesn't like me because I'm white. Right, exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like I never, I never had to go there. I just, I, oh, I would wonder course. why or what happened or who I pissed off or how I did it or whatever, but it never, right. I never got to that scenario. So I think, you know, the fact that you do go there is awful and, and, and rightfully, because there are people out there that are motivated by that still. Yeah. And, 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 and where that's concerned at times, I say this, it's an unwinnable race. And pardon the pun of the word of me using the word race, but it's an unwinnable race. Because what I've seen in instances where people think that way, even if they try to tell you that they don't, and they, more importantly, if they try to convince themselves that they don't, is stand on one leg. Okay. Okay, hop around three times. All right. Okay, go and run the stairs. Okay, random. All right, make a team. Okay, I'm on the team. Okay, be good. Well, you know I was good. All right, well, uh, don't have that car. Well, why not? Uh, well, we're not going to sign it. Well, why? Like, so it, it's, it's almost like in that respect where people are perpetrators of that and have that mentality. Whatever you do, it's not going to be enough. Yeah. So if they say, for example, water, I know you bring water. Oh, it's too wet. Why is it bring wet water? <laughs> well, do you know of dry water? What freaking water do you use? Where do you get your water from? Galilee? Like, I don't understand. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, hey, man, the beach. All right, well, here's the beach. Well, it's, I just feel it's kind of sandy. It's the beach. It's sand. It's going to be sandy. So yeah. that's kind of the thing where I, for the people that were like that, that I've come across personally or professionally, it doesn't matter. Like you can go to any nth degree, you get them, up, whatever it is, it's always a problem. And that's yeah. more a reflection of you, of them, excuse me, than it is of you. Yeah. And then conversely, when you have people that are fair and that are great people, like the great Glenn Sather, for example, you know, Slats, as he's known, architect of the Oilers, been with the Rangers the last 20 plus years, always had diverse teams in, with the oil, always had players from all, all across the world. Uh, him and his wife, great people. They were great to me when I played for the Rangers. We spent some time with them up in Banff uh, during Christmas time or the great Lou Lamorello or the great Jim Rutherford. What you're starting to see for people like that is not only were they top quality people and hockey people, but they're open-minded and they treat people properly. Yeah. So I've had so many more of great people like them than I had the knuckleheads. But the problem is the knuckleheads, unfortunately, when you come across them, uh, they know that they have authority. They also know that they have believability because they know that there's strength in numbers for them. And they'll use those levers to their advantage, whether it's the CBA, whether it's the law, whether it's anything else, although use those levers to their advantage. But the knuckleheads, unfortunately, there's still too many of them and we need to get them out of the game. And, you know, the more that they can lock those types of people up in society, the better for us yeah. all as well. Do you think it's a generational thing? Uh, um, meaning the older you are, the more likely you are to run into that as opposed to like the, the, the I don't know, 
I don't even know why I'm saying that. I'm just trying to remember like when we were playing yeah. and again, the guys I was playing with, I, I don't yeah. remember once for me, like somebody commenting about color. I mean, in the, in the space of that room, right? Like oh, yeah. it was, it, it never to me again, being white seemed like there was, sure. it, it was, it was an issue, but um, did you feel that within a locker room ever? At times. Yeah. I mean, you're predating you by one year in Greensboro. I mean, the OJ trial. When the OJ trial was on and when they had the ruling in the locker room, like we almost, we almost had to fight 20 of our teammates. And that right. was before that predated you by a year. Yeah. But I'm like, guys, I don't know OJ or Al Collins. I don't know what you want me to do. Right. Like I've never been to Brentwood. I hadn't even been to California at that point yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. I've yeah, never yeah. been in LA or what I wasn't at the crime scene. I don't know Judge Ito and I don't know anybody else. I don't know the late Johnny Cochran, like any of these people that were involved in this legal situation. Right. That's not my domain. I'm here to stop pucks. My gear looks kind of sweet. I'm here to kick. <laughs> Let's go try to win some games. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like yeah. I'm here to kick for the boys. Like that's really yeah. what it is. Yeah. So, uh, so that was interesting. That was one time where it was, I mean, you could have cut, if you had a, a Swiss army knife, you could have cut a hole in the middle of the room because it just got so tense sure. around that. But there are instances where, you know, some guys just weren't, good people yeah and whether it's management players coaches but for the most part man i was very fortunate to play with a lot of great guys that are that are great dudes and great people i was very fortunate that way yeah and i think our sport is really good yeah. for that i think but i mean i was thinking that too like just in my own kind of reflection about you know you, you talk about playing with the you know italians or the greeks or you know sure. the black guys or i mean this sure. everyone who comes to that sport we get ripped for it a little bit um meaning yeah. that there's not there's not the big personalities. There's not the flamboyancy and there's not, right. and, 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 we, and we want that as, a, as media. We're saying, let's, let's encourage this. And sure. I, I'm fine with that. But something yeah. that's unique about hockey is that we all kind of are products of our sport and whether it's sure. good or bad, but it, it, it just seemed like we all kind of were the same sort of guy. Just like I, I think how football right. kind of creates a, a sort of guy, baseball creates a sort of guy. Right. You know, like if you watch, it's there, there's a culture to to a sport, you know, and yeah. I think the hockey culture I've always kind of been proud of in the sense that we all kind of ended up in the same spot, whether you're from the farm or whether you're from sure. GTA or wherever, right? Like we kind of, yeah. we sort of fit, you know, we kind of fit in our own way to that one puzzle piece of a room. And I thought, for me, I think that can be celebrated. Um, I don't know. Is, do you think that's something that's okay or would you rather? Yeah. No, what's interesting is that is I love that because I love the consistency of that. I love the... Um, kind of for the most part, the safety around that. So I think that's cool. And I, I like the camaraderie that that brings. Cause I always say, no disrespect. I have friends in every league. I'll say this all the time. I talked to two NBA GMs literally within the last 24 hours, literally, but I have friends in every league in different roles. But what I like about our sport is that consistency. And the fact that, especially when you're on good teams is that, you know, guys will do anything to win. They'll do anything. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. I know. I've never been on a team that's won a Stanley Cup. Um, you know, I was on a team that lost one that went all the way to one and no two in, in Carolina. But literally, man, I'm telling you, like that team, you want to talk about trades? I get traded to that team. I'm not a unicorn anymore because I have an eight pack or a six pack or I'm cut because I'm a goalie and I'm in the gym. I'm not a unicorn anymore. Nobody's saying anything. You know why? Ron Francis is too busy, too busy working. You know why Sammy Kapanen and Brett Hedekin are on foam rollers and it's not me that just has protein. Bzz, bzz, bzz. You can hear the, you can hear the blenders going in the room, protein shake, protein shake. Um, guys are stretching with the stretching bands. Guys are doing plyos. Our great trainer we had at the time, Pete Friesen. It was a culture. Jim Rutherford, God bless him. Who's now GM of Pittsburgh, but Jim Rutherford, Paul Maurice, great coach, great people. They built a, cult, a culture of great people and great pros. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. any one of our group, anyone, Eric Cole, Bates, Batagna, Archer Zerba, any one of those guys, we, we, we will do anything to win. So I love that. And I love that about hockey specifically because the Stanley Cup is the ultimate team trophy, period, in the world of pro, pro sports. And I've worked the last 10 Stanley Cups as, as an analyst, and I get a first-hand bird's-eye view of what it is and what it means and what the teams do to get there let alone having been on a team that got, that got to one. All that to say, I also want to see a little bit of expansion 
because some of the personality that you see from the fellas, it's canned, it's a little bit bottled yeah. to the public. You yeah. get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like think of how many times on the bus, oh, like yeah. you're rolling, like you're rolling, rolling, like almost pee your pants rolling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or you're in the locker room, you're in the dressing room and somebody says something and it's before a big game and you're on the road, you're dying, like you're doubled over. So, or the team playing or whatever else it is. So I also th feel like we keep that in hockey. We insulate that a lot, which is good because it protects it. Yeah. But I'd like to see the door open just a little bit sure. for people to see some of the depth and some of the personality that some of our guys have. Because I bet you what, people would be surprised if it's somebody that's a little more outgoing or flamboyant, but from the media side, in terms of a player towards the media, they get it. But sometimes there's people like, you're like, him? Oh, really? I didn't know he was that funny. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, 100%. 100%. Kind of so I'd like to see the door open just a little bit. Yeah, I so agree. People could, could see that a bit. Oh, Weeksy, I'm like, okay, like, we got to cut you off. I told you. I told you that we were going to keep it to 130. Can you give me one or two more? Go ahead. Well, you, I, want, I have all my notes here about O2, man. Can we get into O2? Yeah, sure. Because sure. that's ridiculous, man. Like, so, Carol, yeah. I went back into the stats. Like, so, Arturs is there. You guys are going on. Man. And you man. get in. You, why did you, first of all, why did you get in? Did, did he have a, I saw that he lost four to one in the one game, and then he lost one in overtime, then you got in. Was he injured, or was that just a call from Maurice to say, you know what, let's try something new here? Archie and I are boys to this day. And what a lot of people may or may not know, we have the same agent, Paul Theophanis, out of New York. And, and we have the same agent then. And I still use Paul for a lot of my TV stuff anyways. My agent, he's great. Great person. Served the country. Uh, U.S. Delta Force, Green Beret. Like, awesome. Awesome dude. Went to Harvard. Like, Greek-American. Like, the whole thing. Just an awesome dude. So, what was weird is kind of the backstory is when I played in the CHL top prospect game in Kitchener, I guess it would have been 95 or whatever it would have been. Paul Maurice was our coach. Okay. And Jim Rutherford used to run the Detroit junior wings, which, um, which were owned of course by Mr. Carmanos who owned the Canes. So they started in junior together, tier two, then the O, then they went to Hartford, then it went to Hartford, moved to Carolina. So that's kind of the backstory where they knew me from junior. So when they traded for me and I first went in the office and stuff, they were so nice, man. They were so great to me. But Paul told me right from the hop, he's like, hey, listen, man, seeing the way you're practicing, just be ready. Because some of the guys on the team were like, hey, man, like, just be ready. Just be ready. I'm going to go to you if I, if I have to. Archie's awesome. He's our dude. But I wouldn't hesitate to put you in the net. So I was like, okay, cool, man. Like, I was kind of, you know, feeling it. And my game had gotten to a point. And I just came from Tampa playing with great players. And Brad Richards, LeCavier, Dave Andertruck, all these guys. Nikolai Habibulin, more importantly for me. Because I was able to learn so much from the Bulin. I was he good. Because he played the style that I had been working on since I was with the Islanders with Sudsy. But it's like the Bulin wall is that. Like he does that. So I go on the ice early with him and our goalie coach, Jeff Reese, who was great for me, him and hmm. Reeser. I go on the, on the, and I was basically like mimicking almost everything about him. The way he played, his stance, where his weight was in his stance, all the technical butterfly drills that I was becoming more and more proficient at. So it all kind of culminated with that. I was perfectly healthy, 5% body fat, if that at the time. I was just like tuned. And everything was tuned. And you know the feeling you get as a player. You know when you're like, my feet feel right in my skates. My curve feels perfect. The whip of my sticks, my flex is everything's perfect. I'm going to go out there and rock it. You, I'm sure you had that. You knew that as a player when you yeah, had those, yeah. that feeling. Or stretches when you felt that way. And I just felt that way. So Archie had gotten pulled a couple times and I went into mop up a couple times early in the series. And I, as ironic as fate would have it, if I looked out the front door, I could see the old Meadowlands, the rig where the Devils played. So that's where we played against the Devils. And what was wild is to start that, uh, that game five at home, I didn't know I was starting. And, and Paul called me in the office. Coach Maurice called me in the office. And I, I'm going to respect your audience, so I can't be as real as I really want to be if you and I were speaking at uh, Joey's or whatever back in, out there in BC. But I'm telling you now, he calls me in the office, and he had a chew-in. 
And he's like, you're going tomorrow. You're going. I want you to let those big old things hang down like church bells and you're going tomorrow. You're going to have a game for us. I swear <laughs> to God. <laughs> and I swear to God, I didn't know if to laugh. I almost broke out in immediate sweat because now the reality of the reality was coming in. This is Stanley Cup playoffs. This is the New Jersey Devils. This is the great New Jersey Devils and all the great components that they have in their Martin group. Brodeur. Marty down to the far end and Bravo Bravo. Now remember, I've gotten into two games already to mop up. Those are the but two now, losses? Correct. But, so now they're like, but you're going. So he's telling me, he's like, let them hang down like church bells. Put them on the line. Let them hang. Go and play your game. And I'm like, is this guy for real? So I swear to God, I, I, I remember the flip-flops I had, like my shower shoes. They were red Nike flip-flops. I don't even think they were touching the ground when I walked out of his office. I think I was levitating. I had to be at least of maybe half a foot off the, off the floor in the, in the locker room. So I get back in there. I'm like, okay, finish my stretches, shower. And like from then up until that puck drop, it was the most locked in I've ever been at any time in my life, ever. And I think I, call, I called my parents to tell them, blah, blah, blah. I didn't get on the phone, you know, my then whatever girlfriend at the time, whatever the case may be. And I didn't get on the phone after that. And I was like dialed. I was watching video. I was visualizing. I was reading, going through my mental prep, visualizing, blah, blah, blah. And when I came to the rink, it was on. Like that, next, that game five, it was on. And we had such, as I said, which is more important, we had so many good players and consummate pros on our team that we actually thought we had a shot to beat the New Jersey Devils because we knew how much work we put in. Do you know what I mean? You've been yeah. on those teams where, you know, you don't have to go give a guy a nudge. Hey man, come do a little 10 minute bike circuit or sprint. Or, you didn't have to, everybody was doing that. And that was the culture. So it kind of gave us this confidence that, you know, we can play with these guys. We, we ended up winning that game in OT, the late Joe Vasacek, our teammate, big number 63 who perished in the plane crash in Russia in the KHL years back. He scored the overtime winner, and that place was – I thought the, the roof was going to pop off at the arena in Carolina, man. And that was like – so just kind of those vibes and that feeling, I had that, and I just continued that. And then we came here to Jersey, as I said, just down the road, ironically enough, and we shut them out in the elimination game. And then things just kind of rolled from there, and – then we played Montreal, shut out Montreal in game one at home. Then I thought, then we lost game two. Yeah. And then we go to Montreal and then we lost in OT. And here's what's ironic. We lost, I, thought, I think we lost 2-1 in OT. Yannick Perot scored. And that's when the idiot knucklehead fan threw a banana at me in Montreal that game. Uh, Stanley Cup playoff game. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So then that became a thing, and then I tried to defuse it, and, the, you know, whatever. And then uh, the next game we played, and I was – I think we were down 2 nothing after the first, and Coach Mole came in. He's like, Weeksy, you've been whatever. You've been awesome. I'm Arch is going in. And that was called the miracle at Molson to this day because the rink was called the Molson Center before it was the Bell Center now. And Archie went in and started kicking again. He looked like himself again. We came all the way back. We won that game. And then right. that turned everything for us again. We had another, like, kind of huge turbo right. boost. And then we mowed Montreal down. We mowed Toronto down, which is beautiful. Coming from Toronto, beating those guys is a beauty. And then uh, we went to Stanley Cup final, and we met, our, you know, we met our maker. That Detroit team had, I don't know, 10 Hall of Famers on it. Close but, games, though, boy. I was looking at that. Close games. Man. But that, was your first, that was your first run in the playoffs as a, as a yeah. player? Yeah. What an unbelievable ride. And then, like – you talked so about you I mean you talked about that knocking like coming in there, forty saves like you didn't talk forty saves you, you, in your first ever playoff start in the three two overtime win against Martin Broder. I had forty two mm -hmm. shots, forty saves, then a shutout in game mm -hmm. six to beat Martin Broder, like generational type goaltender. Maybe some say that could be the best to ever play. Right. You're on the other end of that. Like, what an amazing yeah. experience. And then you step in against Jose Theodore, who wasn't yeah. a slouch himself. League MVP um, year. Yeah, exactly. Winner, yeah. 
my Jose uh, gold awesome medal on my world too. junior team. Unbelievable yeah. guy. And he shut yeah, him awesome out and them out too. Like what an awesome run. Like I was, I was getting goosebumps even looking at it. And I'm like, I can't oh, wait to talk you. to Weeksy about that, man. Like that's thank unbelievable. Like, time. yeah, you know, what a role. Here's my thing about that, that I'd say too, is I always talk about like the power of possibilities, like the power of infinite possibilities. And Here's my problem when I, when I say a lot of people, like, they'll try to really pigeonhole. And they'll say, well, that's not good because it's not Boston. Or it's not good because it's not Calgary. Or it's not good because it's an NHL team in the South. Or this player can't be a good player because they grew up in the projects or whatever it is. That's, people are so lost when it comes to that because so many great things happen through the power of possibilities. So, you know, it just so happened that for you, pardon me, it just so happened that for you, that you played against me and I played against you in Kamloops. Yep. But then we play against each other in pro, we play with each other in pro. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if that is cut off in Bantam at the Kibbit at Campbell's International Bantam Tournament, if that's cut off, then you don't get there, I don't get there. Mm -hmm. Or I get there and you don't get there, or the reverse. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So the power of the possibility and the infinite possibilities and what can happen and what things can, how things can be manifested and how you can have success and the different things that you can accomplish or you can accomplish with your teammates. That's exactly what that whole spring was like of O2 for our team. Cause we weren't supposed to be that it was a Southern team in a non hockey market, but yet still we had the best atmosphere of any rink out of the 16 teams in that playoffs. Like right. that's where tailgating started. Yeah. All this outdoor stuff that you see now outside rinks, that's where it started. Right. Podsy, our fan, like we would go to pregame skate, the Kaniacs as they're affectionately known, we're out there at 10 in the morning, bro. Awesome. 10 in the morning. And they're grilling and they're playing cornhole and <laughs> they're playing street hockey and they're throwing footballs around. That's where all that originated. Yeah. So it was really cool because in a lot of ways, we shocked the world. We didn't really shock each other, but we shocked the world through coming together. And that market at that time really paved the way as you know, when the Panthers got to Stanley Cup final against Colorado, you saw, it was Bedlam down there yeah. in Miami. You know, so those types of things have helped pave the way for the awesome atmosphere in Nashville, the awesome atmosphere in Tampa. Tampa going on to win a Stanley Cup final. Nashville getting to a Cup final. Carolina then going back after we went in 02 and winning against the Oilers. Um, and then same thing for the teams out in California. And more importantly, for the Vegas Golden Knights. Where, and remember, everybody was saying the same. Why don't they put a team up in Saskatoon? Why don't they put a team in Quebec City? Why is the commissioner putting? I just talked to Commissioner Bettman about this. It's like Vegas, if you haven't been for any of the listeners out there, whenever social distancing is a thing of the past, please get to a Vegas Golden Knights game. It'll blow your mind. The atmosphere is wild. So we, we were kind of like up the Florida Panthers before us, but then our O2 team were kind of the uh, – the proving ground of how well hockey can work in the South and just what you're able to accomplish. And keep this in mind, Podsy, I know you're a former Leaf, but the Leafs haven't been to the Stanley Cup since 67, which predates his current group. And I told Sheldon Keefe that the other day, their head coach, I told Keefe for that, but, and Austin Matthews for that matter. But if you think of all the hotbeds and all the Southern teams, every one of them has been to the Stanley Cup final with the exception of, of, of the Coyotes, every one of them. And the Leafs haven't been since 67. So that's what I'm saying about if you just try to marginalize things or people or places or whatever, marketplaces or whatever, you never know what's around the corner. Yeah, 100%. I was thinking about Pete Carroll, who I, who I like following, for head coach of the Seattle Seahawks, yeah. and he, they yeah. always say something, something good is about to happen. And, yes. uh, and I love that philosophy just in life, right? If you're looking for that, right? If you're looking for that, what's, what, what's, what's good is about to happen? I mean, it's, it's, uh, that changes your perspective and what you're looking at and what you're dealing with. You touch on so many things. I'm going to let you go. I mean, I, I would love, I didn't even get into the fact of like mm. the preparation aspect of a goalie, like what, what, what you do in a game 
between goals, after goals? How do you, how do you get ready in the off season? Like for all the goalies out there that, you know, want to hear from somebody like you, who's been through it. Like we didn't even get into any of I'll that. Give you a one of them. Yeah. It would, it would be awesome to get you back. And, and even talking about like that experience of being in the NHL on a team that hasn't been successful, at least in recent history to a sure. team that is successful going to the final, how it feels like that's a, almost you're in a different league. Like it, you're still the NHL, but it's like, until you've experienced that, like what you're talking about, that Carolina scenario, you don't know, right? You, you really don't, don't know. Um, Cause there's so much to touch on there from your analyst side too. Like the guys like McDavid and Dreisaitl, unbelievable players in their own right, but haven't necessarily experienced that thing yet, you know, and, and, totally. and that coming of age process of that. And there, there's obviously a ton to talk about. You are amazing as always. I really, really you, appreciate man. you for being on, man. Uh, so good to hear your stories again and your impersonations and so <laughs> many memories from me are coming back. Like I, I'm just going to be chuckling all day today. So awesome, awesome stuff. Um, Thanks. Thank I know my I know my listeners are going to love it, man. And, and I know you're a really busy man. So thank you for, for spending the time with me today. Appreciate it. You're more than welcome. Ponzi, thanks for the awesome combo, man. It was great connecting with you. Keep up the great work. You're doing awesome stuff. And uh, we'll do part two. It might cost you a steak, maybe not a porterhouse, maybe a filet, <laughs> maybe a 10 ounce or eight ounce filet. But it'll cost you some, but we'll work that out on the back end. But no, all, like all jokes aside, you're doing, you're doing a great job with this because you're helping to bring a lot of the viewers inside the game. And, and I always say there's a real tight connection between life and sport. And I know a lot of people look at them separately, but there's a real tight connection with the two. You've done a nice job of bridging that in a lot of your, your content that you're doing. So keep up the great work. We're, we have you as an honorary. You haven't, you haven't necessarily gotten your card in the mail. We haven't issued it yet for the goal union, but you're an honorary <laughs> member. You're an honorary member. But you know what? It, it's going to be coming your way shortly. Okay, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate <laughs> it. And, and actually, and thanks yeah. on that, because I, I do talk about the person and the player. And I think that there yeah. people talk about the player a lot. And I think when I try and ask questions about the person, and I think the game in general is becoming a little bit more about the person as opposed to just the player on the ice. And I think the organizations wow. that are getting that right are, uh, yeah. are having a lot of success because of it. So once wow. again, man, thanks so much. Um, best of luck with everything you're doing. And until part appreciate two you. rolls along, um, thank you. Love you, man. Thanks for having me on. It was awesome. Thank you all for being here today. And thank you for listening to that conversation with Kevin. And Kevin, if you're listening right now, uh, I really appreciate you spending the time, your time, uh, which is our most valuable resource to share your experience and your story with my audience. I know there has been every major platform right now for Kevin that's been asking for his opinion and rightfully so uh, wanting his voice to be heard about what his thoughts are on the state of our game and what we can do better and, and how we can improve this game. So it is a safe place. It is an accessible place. It is a it is a place that anyone with any color skin, with any religion, from any country in the world can play and reap the benefits of the sport without having to worry about persecution or racial judgment or prejudice or uh, epi epithets being thrown at them. Uh, and any of the other atrocities that have come out at the minor league level and even at the NHL level. Uh, I am a believer that our sport is doing a pretty good job. Uh, I am a believer that the people involved in the sport are good people. Uh, but we got to get rid of the outliers and we have to make a change and recognize that a change needs to be made. And by doing that, as Kevin would say, Part of that job is becoming better humans, standing up for people when we know things aren't right, uh, creating rules and legislations around our tolerance for what is expected, what is demanded within our sport. We cannot be silent anymore and we have to become better people. And I think as we become better people, we become we become more tolerant of others and less tolerant of the BS that goes on sometimes. And, uh, and we also can empathize more. And I know myself personally can start to try and see things through somebody else's eyes and through somebody else's shoes. And, and, and again, the more we are collectively able to do that, our sport becomes a better place to be. So 
that was my takeaway from today. I hope it was your takeaway. I know it's really important to Kevin and a lot of us within the sport that this now becomes relevant and becomes something that we continue to move forward in to make this game as great as it can be for as many people as possible. So make sure you tune in next time. Kevin, thanks again. And as always, play hard and keep your head up.